I, I do want people to touch the sculpture and I do want their fingers to make a mark. Uh, there's acid on the tips of your fingers, you know, that can eventually eat away at the patina. And I like that look. Uh, it's like the look of the Buddha's belly, you know, that get rubbed historically and that that part shines from all the rubbing and Ona is, is awaiting that. And it, of course, it'll take a long time to happen. But as I watched it this past Sunday morning, I saw that maybe one out of seven people, when they walked by, that they would actually touch the piece. I've been in Brooklyn for a very long time. I feel as though I was born in New York City. I came with my little girl, three and a half year old, whose name is also Ursula, to New York City in 1973. So in 1981, I moved into a loft on the second floor of 429 South Fifth Street, Williamsburg. By the time 24 years passed, it got gentrified. It was time for me to leave. This was about 10, 11 years ago. I feel great in this studio. I feel like I have all the space that I need. It's a place that was really industrial when I first moved in. It has become an artist's neighborhood and I can hardly think of any other kind of a neighborhood that is more likable. I knew from the beginning that I wanted to be placed under the overhang as it gave me some sort of enclosure, some sort of framing. The most important thing is for the, the piece, the sculpture, to have a strong presence in front of a building that was that huge, that large, that much of Corten steel. I then made a full-scale cedar model that was 20 feet high. When David Berliner came into my studio with Arnold Lehman, the director of the Brooklyn Museum, I think he was totally overwhelmed. He, was, he, he couldn't believe that what was in front of him was actually not so unlike what was going to be placed in front of the Barclay Center. Arnold fell in love with the piece and he was very vocal about that. David Berliner was extremely excited. And there's no way that this could have happened if I had built them a one-foot model. It would not have been understandable. So I had to do this, and it was a chance that I took. It took me many months to build this, uh, but um, it worked. The name of the sculpture is Ona, O-N-A, and in Polish, it refers to a female, as in her. She is walking by, and to have a she presence in front of the Barclay Center is good. In the building of my cedar sculpture, I use four by four cedar beams. The cutters in my studio cut away at the lines that I draw for them to cut on all four sides of the 4x4. Four four. And then we bring it back to the sculpture. And I know, because I've cut for 25 years myself, what will happen not only on the external part of the cedar, but also on the internal part with the lines that I draw for them. And we have all sorts of codes that I use when they need to nibble away more than once at a certain corner, or when there's a knobby coming out, that there are all sorts of codes that I draw for them on the 4x4. From the cedar, 
I can eke out something from the complete geometry of the 4x4 four four beam by nibbling with the circular saw. I can force a surface that feels, I don't know whether one wants to use the word humane or that feels welcoming as the physical part of the sculpture keeps growing, they all get screwed together with a screw gun. Then it's glued. We glue one layer a day. We're at Polich Talix Artworks. It is north of New York City, about an hour and a half. And it's actually a foundry that does bronze casting extraordinarily well. I used bronze for the Barclay Center because I knew that many, many people would walk by it. This was a place where there's a lot of pollution. There's roads that fence in the Barclay Center. Anyway, I wanted this to last Actually, bronze lasts 2,000 years, so it, it lasts. But additionally, you know, you can also, if one treats it in the right way, because bronze can often look foreboding, it can often look harsh and hard and distant. So I went out of my way to make a patina that wasn't that, a patina that felt as though it were, in a sense, reaching out, but not gaudy, not wild. And it had uh, a huge array of colors in it, but they were related to the earth. There's a way in which I identified with the people of Polish Talix because they too work physically. They work on someone else's work but nevertheless, they actually build sculpture. I practiced for a number of days to figure out just where I wanted this patina to go. And when I came close to finding what I wanted, it shocked me because the surface looked almost like an impressionistic painting, you know, with sloshes of colors that were floating near one another. I seem to be addicted to the sweat and the work and the labor that's connected to my making my work. And I feel like I need to be in control of every facet of it. Uh, hence, I couldn't just hand over the patina to someone because to be perfectly honest, I didn't know clearly enough what it was that it needed in the different places to be able to explain it. And it couldn't be explained that clearly because all the judgments were visual judgments. So, it was a real gift in terms of this being an experiment. But I often wish that I could farm things out. But even my being able to farm out a full-scale cedar sculpture to be then made into bronze was a huge step for me. She was transported, they had to get a permit to cross the George Washington Bridge. And it went over the uh, Manhattan Bridge, straight onto Flatbush. There's a bar that is welded onto the inside of the sculpture that the crane picks up and is actually able to lift the entire sculpture because it's a single piece. After which there was a uh, forklift that took over 
and how that forklift, which didn't look so big, had the capacity to carry 12,000 pounds, is, I was very um, proud of that forklift. When I make the sculpture and when I make it that high, there's an instinct that I have of making it balance itself, even though it's got many holes that look like they were punched in, many concave, many convex forms all over, that I still have an instinct for being able to balance it in a way so that there isn't, you know, 90% of it or 80% of it or even 70% of it, you know, leaning over too heavily. But with bronze, you can do that. You can lean. And I'm thinking of doing some of those leaning pieces with bronze uh, because you have a very strong base that can hold it. Even though the piece is huge, it's not at all overpowering. In fact, it has nothing to do with power. Uh, it has something to do with grace. It has something to do with movement. But I don't want to go be, get too descriptive about what the result is because I am sort of very open, the sculpture itself wants to be open to many, many metaphors. I don't want it to be one thing. I don't want it to be the thing. There is no the thing. One of the most important things for me with Ona and where she stands is the fact that anyone, everyone, can go by, can look, not look, can touch, not touch. She can have a huge variety of impacts or none at all. It is not something that you're forced to take seriously. Uh, although it is my hope that just the scale itself and what's on, on the surface of Ona, that there might be a kind of attraction toward her, but it's not you know, it's not forced. And I think even that you have traffic going by both ways, you have the sounds, you have other people bumping into you, you have a mission that you, I'm sure, want to accomplish when you're walking through that plaza. Many people do walk through that plaza. That plaza is like one of the only openings in that part of Brooklyn. I want Ona to be a piece that people coming out of the subway and from the trains to, you know, be something that they can think of in time as being a familiar landmark, as being uh, something that, you know, might have enough variety in it that would keep their interest. And if it doesn't, then that's okay too. But I think she tries, Ona tries hard to keep their visual interests.